let's see who we've got today. I'm going, hi everyone, welcome. Let me get my slides up here. Let's see, see who's joining us today. Um, hi everyone, it is Wednesday, so that means it is time for Teen Science Cafe. For those of you who are new and have never been to a Teen Science Cafe, I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator here for the Vermont 4-H Program. And the way we get started, let me actually get my slides in the right place. So we like to introduce ourselves. If you can find the chat box, I see some of you have already gone in and done it. Hi, Emily and Anna. Um, what we like is let us know who you are and where you're from. The cool things ab about these teen science cafes, even though Vermont 4-H runs them, we welcome youth from all over the country. And we often do have folks that don't live in Vermont, but I see Emily's here from New Hampshire and Todd's here and Palin and Katie are here. Oh, Palin from Illinois, welcome back. Um, Sage is with us today. So keep introducing yourselves. Oh, my friend Desmond's here from Rhode Island and Jill's from Duxbury. Sage is with us again from Maine. Hi, Braden from Vermont. So great that you all are joining us again. Love it. So as we um, continue on, actually, I need to do one thing. I'm going to do a stop share just for one moment. I have to pop into the chat for those of you who need our live captioning, I'm gonna put the link for you in the chat box so you can follow along. So if you need live captioning, the link has just been put into the chat box. I'm gonna go back to the slideshow. And let me just open up my chat, there we go. Okay, so we're doing our introductions. Who else has joined us? I see Ken and Yuri. Let's see. Uh, great. Okay, so I put the chat in, uh, the link in for the live captioning. And then I wanna remind everyone when we're here in Zoom and in our science cafes, everybody's muted. So nobody has the ability to talk and nobody else has video other than myself and our presenter. So the way that you all communicate is through the chat box and through our Q&A box. We use those two things very differently, so pay attention here. The chat box we use to communicate back and forth with the presenter. They might ask a question of you, you're gonna respond, or if you have something to add that's related to today's topic. So the chat box is not to just have random conversations and not to just kind of like have random thoughts. This The chat box is on topic because if it's not, it ends up being distracting for people and it can really take away from everyone's ability to pay attention. So chat box, you stay on topic. Um, and the Q&A box is where you're gonna put your questions for the presenter. So don't put your questions in the chat box. You use the Q&A box and the presenter will get to your questions as there's breaks throughout the um, presentation today. We always try to get to every question, so we're going to do our best like we always do. Um, we ask that you're just courteous and respectful to one another. Um, again, no distractions. It's really only the chat box that can be that way, so I will monitor it. If I see there's some abuse of chat box going on, I will private message you and let you know that you need to stop. <laughs> but most of you have been really good, so I'm not too worried. So just stay engaged, participate fully. We have a really good topic today. Before we get to the topic today, I do wanna remind you all, and I'll put the, the links in the chat box. So we have a couple of more cafes um, this month, two more, um, and that will wrap up our fall cafe series. I literally, about a half an hour ago, just posted our winter series to our website. You can't register yet, but you'll be able to see the titles of the topics. We don't have any cafe flyers yet, but at least you'll get to see um, what's gonna be presented um, starting in January. 
We also um, are gonna be offering another Learn to Code program starting in January. So for those of you who wanna learn um, some coding, you can check out what we're gonna do in this program. So that is new. I tell you every week, our friends at the Vermont Brain Bee, they have weekly sessions for those of you interested in learning about the brain and neuroscience. You can join up with them at any time. You can reach out, learn more at vermontbrainbee.com. And then our friends at Lake Champlain Sea Grant, they have one more session of their Zuma scientist um, this week, December 4th. And then our friends in Maine um, are continuing their teen science cafes. So they have some more. Again, I'll put these links in the chat so you will be able to access them if you want. Um, I want to be able to, sorry, I forgot to upload my information I need for the next slide. So just give me one second. You are witnessing me having too much to do today and not getting everything I needed ready for today. So I apologize. Um, just give me one second. Oh my lordy. All right. Well, I can't find it. So today's presentation, you're going to be learning about three dimensional cell culture. Why Flat Stanley is a great learning tool, but not for studying cells. Our presenter is Brad Larson and Brad works for a company called Biotech. I'm gonna turn it over to Brad. Um, I'm gonna let him introduce himself, let, let you know a little bit about his background, and then we're gonna just jump right into his presentation today. So I'm gonna stop sharing and let's all welcome Brad to our Teen Science Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Awesome, thanks, Lauren. I appreciate the, the introduction. So, um, Welcome everybody. I'm, I'm really happy to be a, um, a part of this and uh, hope that you find what I'm going to talk about today um, interesting. So I'm just going to, I'll tell you a little bit about myself while I'm getting my, um, my slides pulled up. So, um, so like Lauren said, um, I work for a company called Biotech Instruments, which is right in Vermont and um, in uh, Winooski. Um, so I've worked there since 2009, um, and I was a, um, an application scientist there for about nine and a half years. Um, and let's see, I'm just trying to get the, the, the chats pulled up here. Um, uh, all right, I'll do my best. It's kind of floating around Lauren as its own um, uh, the chat is window yep so, yeah, I'm so then, can... then don't then don't do it if it's going to be distracting to you okay hopefully I can still see it while I'm in um, presenter mode because that's what I'm hoping to hoping to do so we'll do our best um, all right so I'm going to move this into presentation mode um, Oh, it's still there. So that's good. That's perfect. So, all right. So, um, like, I, like I said, I was um, an application scientist with biotech for about nine and a half years and um, in Vermont. And then about two years ago, I moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. And now I'm a field scientist, what's called a field scientist, still with biotech. So I interact a lot with, um, with our uh, researchers that use our products um, and I'm going into their labs and helping them set up new experiments and, and things like that. So one thing I've done um, a lot of work with over the years is working with 3D cell culture. So, and this is becoming uh, much more important um, in lots of areas of research. Uh, so I thought this would be a great topic to, um, to talk to you guys about. So I'm gonna, you know, kind of go over why it's important um, we'll talk a little bit about how, you know, we see cells and how we see cells in, in, when they're in, in 3D. And then I'll give you a little bit, a uh, couple of examples of some projects that I've done over the years um, working with cells uh, in 3D. So, all right. So, um, so moving forward. Uh, come on. There we go. All right. So to begin with, um, I'm sure everybody learned this, you know, way back in, in grade school that, of course, our bodies and bodies of animals and, and things like that are all made of 
uh, different organs and tissues. Uh, so what we're seeing here, you know, you can see, you know, kind of this model's heart and their lungs and kidneys and, and liver and things like that. So, um, and all of those are in, you know, three dimensions. They all have length, they all have width, and they all have a certain depth um, or a certain, uh, a certain thickness. And then if we kind of look further, um, you know, inside, uh, you know, we all know that all of these organs and these tissues are made up of cells, you know, and that's why we're, um, you know, that's what we're made of, are all these different types of cells. So you have, you know, skin cells and you have bone cells and cells that make up your lungs and cells that make up your heart. Um, even, you know, like I said, your, your skin and your muscles um, and all the different organs that you have. And almost all of these cells exist in groups of cells. And again, they're in three dimensions. So there's lots of these cells that come together and you know, they come together from, you know, uh, to make, you know, uh, length of cells and width of these groups of cells. And again, most of them are also kind of piled on top of each other in three dimensions. So again, they have a certain thickness to each other. Um, there are some cells that don't exist in three dimensions um, and kind of the probably the most, uh, you know, well known are your blood cells. So whether those are red blood cells, or white blood cells, um, and there are a few other types of cells that exist um, in your body that, that aren't in, in 3D, but most of them, um, like I said, are, are 3D. So that takes us to our first um, question. So Lauren, um, do you want me to read it, or do you, did you want to read the, the question? Oh yeah, I can. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll right now. It's on the slide, but what you're going to be asked to do is which cell type does not exist as a group of cells? Do you think it's bone cells, blood cells, lung cells, or kidney cells? If you don't actually see this poll that launched, you can put your answer in the chat. Um, but let's see what you think. Which cell type does not exist as a group of cells? And while okay. they're answering, Cheyenne asked in the chat, why is that important? Uh, why is it important that, that cells are in 3D? Is that, what you, is that what you mean, Cheyenne? You can write yes or no in the chat, Cheyenne, to help <laughs> us understand. Yeah, okay. she says yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's um, I mean, th the point that I'm trying to make is that that's just how we are. It's, it's important because what, what I'm gonna talk about in the next couple slides, are how um, scientists work um, with cells when they're not in your body, because you know lots of scientists have to. They're doing research, um, whether it's maybe looking for, uh, uh, hopefully trying to find a cure for cancer, or maybe a treatment for diabetes or Alzheimer's disease, or maybe they're um, they're working with, uh, um, you know, testing different chemicals uh, to see if they're harmful for the environment or, or harmful for you, you know, like in when you're working with them. And it's and so I'm going to talk about, you know, why that's important. But what I'm what I'm trying to um, at first kind of help you guys understand is that when cells are inside your body or what we call, there's a term that what we call in vivo, then that means in your body that they actually exist in three dimensions. So that's just kind of getting, getting you to think that, of course, you know, we, you know, we're, we're three dimensional people, right? You know, um, and, you know, so that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. So, um, so I see the results for the poll and it looks like um, you guys did a great job and the answer is uh, blood cells. So bones, if, so if you think about your bone, you know, just think about it. If you think about your bones, if you think about your lungs, if you think about your kidneys, those organs are all, again, three dimensional, right? So, um, so they're not just flat, but they also have a thickness. Now blood cells, like I said a couple slides ago, exist on their own. So they're just kind of floating around in your bloodstream, you know, doing their thing. Um, so they exist kind of separately. So they're more of a two-dimensional type of, uh, um, you know, they have a little bit of a thickness, of course, 
um, but they're much more two-dimensional than, um, than those other types of cells. So good job, good job, everybody. So, um, all right. So I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep going on. So um, just oh. quickly, Ken yeah. is asking, how does Flat Stanley play in? Just wondering. Well, I'm gonna tell you, interest? Ken. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, Ken, so just bear with me here. So you, that was a great question and a great lead into my next slide. So, um, so again, and I, I saw um, earlier in the chat that somebody had said that they had read the Flat Stanley book. So, or I guess it was Emily. Um, and I, so whether you've read the books or not, I, I think most, you know, most everybody probably did a project, again, um, most likely when you were back in grade school with Flat Stanley. And usually, you know, you read the books and then you kind of cut out a little, you know, thing of Flat Stanley, you colored it in and then you mailed it to, you know, your family and friends and things like that. So, um, but of course, you know, Stanley's thing is that he's flat. So he is only two dimensional. Um, so what the, the, the point that I'm making here is that, you know, if we think about what I just said about how um, cells in a real person are three-dimensional, so Flat Stanley, you know, obviously he's a fun character and they're great books and they're great ways to learn, but if you want to think about, you know, is he a great representation for what a real person is if you, you know, if you're talking about biology and cells, not so much. So, um, so that's the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, it, you know, Flat Stanley's fun, but if we really want to think about, um, if we really want to, you know, think about a person or again, an animal, you know, we really need to think about how their cells are in three dimensions. So, but it's great, uh, great lead in Ken, I appreciate the question. So, so here in this slide, this is, um, a, yeah, a, Again, a representation of, um, of you know, a better representation of what cells actually look like um, inside your body. So they're, they're pictures that have been taken, or like the one in the top left is kind of a computer representation of how your cells look or might look um, inside of your body. The, the, the picture on the top right is a picture of um, like capillaries, um, you know, again, so that's what your blood is flowing through. Um, but again, the, you know, what makes up where, what the blood cells are inside, those are still three dimensional. Um, the picture on the bottom left is kind of more representation of cells um, in the brain. And then the one on the right is kind of a representation of, again, what an organ would look like inside your body. So again, these are all in three, um, in three dimensions. Okay, so again, now getting back to um, the question about why is this important? So, um, and again, maybe you guys have already done this in your science classes, but for many, many years, decades, actually, um, uh, scientists have been working with cells outside of the body or, or what that term is called in vitro. So, um, uh, so you know, again, a long time ago, uh, when first when people uh, first started working with cells, they actually worked with cells in 3D because they would just take whole tissues or whole organs out of uh, a person's body and they were kept alive for short amounts of time and then scientists would do tests on them. So of course that was in three dimensions. So then um, Oh, like, um, like, like probably way before you know you guys were born. Back in the 1990s, um, companies called uh, pharmaceutical companies, such as like Pfizer, and, and Pfizer has actually been a company that's been in the news these days because, of course, I'm sure everybody's heard about the vaccine that they're developing for um, against the uh, the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So companies like Pfizer and, and others. Um, at that time, they were, so, so those companies are, are most of what they do is they look for treatments for, again, maybe it's cancer, or maybe it's um, Alzheimer's disease or high blood pressure or whatever it is. And they have these um, molecules or, they, or they, they sometimes call them compounds. And they're, they're, again, they're chemical molecules and they can sometimes have a beneficial effect. Like maybe they might be 
able to kill cancer cells or you know they they have the effect that the company is looking for and they had all of these molecules all of these compounds sometimes like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and they needed a way to test these on cells to see if they had the right effect uh, but they needed to be able to do it really fast and easy and efficiently so using you know whole tissues or whole organs was not a, an efficient way and not a fast way to do it so what they did was they looked for more easy ways to do this so what they would do is they would take the cells again maybe from um, a cancer tumor and they would do what's called uh, they would culture them and if you look at the pictures on the right of this slide the, the one in the top right is actually you know um, what I was talking about before so that would be kind of a piece of tissue that would be um, kept alive for a while and then the one in the bottom right this this piece of this kind of plastic is called a flask so you put cells on the bottom of this flask and then the red part is what we call media and it contains all kinds of components and things like that that the cells like. It's like their food, um, so it helps to keep them alive. But the cells then, what was easy is that they would put the cells on the bottom of these plastic surfaces in two dimensions, so more like flat Stanley, um, because it was easy for them and they could grow up lots of cells and they could test all these molecules and compounds really fast um, to see what, you know, if something had the effect they wanted. The problem is that um, you know at the at the end of this testing, these companies then have to test these um, potential drugs on people. Again, just like you know you've been hearing about um, these vaccines that again companies like Pfizer and Moderna they have to test them on people, right, to make sure that they work. So it's the same thing here. So that they would they would take these new potential drugs. And then after they tested them with the, the cells in 2D, they, they would test them on real people to make sure that they were, and that's called a, um, like a clinical test. So they would test them on people. And a lot of times those drugs wouldn't work. Um, you know, and they realized that that's because they were initially testing them on cells in 2D, not like a person. And then when you get them into an actual person, of course, many times they behave differently. And, and so all that work and all that time and all that money would go to nothing and they would have to start over. So then people finally realized, well, we need, we should really be testing our, you know, potential treatments and things like that on using cells in a way that really represents what they would look like and how they would act when they're inside a person. And it makes sense, right? So that's how you should um, so that's how you should do it. So, um, okay, so that leads us to our second question, which is, so if you think about what I just said in the last slide, um, when, these, uh, um, when these treatments, um, again, were developed by these companies using cells that were cultured in 2D first, and then were tested on people, were they either a rarely successful and failed a lot of the time or were they really successful very successful and hardly fails at all all right so the poll has been launched if for some reason you don't see it put your answer in the chat but i see many of you have already started putting your answers in so let's give it a little few more seconds Try to get a few more of you responding, see what you think. But right now, A is the big <laughs> Clearly the winning. <laughs> so I think there's a fairly good consensus here. There <laughs> is, which is good, which is good. So, so the question um, is on the slide, so you can just respond in the chat if you don't see it. So the question is, when treatments that were developed using cells cultured in 2D were tested on people, were they A, rarely successful and failed many times, or B, very successful and hardly failed at all? So Desmond, I am showing the poll right <laughs> now. I'm gonna share the results. So again, you can either see the poll on the slide and put your answer in the chat, or you can see the poll that I launched. For some reason, 
and everyone's computer is just a little bit different. And I don't know why. Every now and then there's one or two of you. That's how it goes. Right, right. But the majority so. is 88% of you, and then a few of you in the chat said A, rarely successful, yep. Yep. And failed many times. I'm assuming they were right. <laughs> they are right. Yes, that's that's right, Lauren. So good job. Good job, guys. So that is true. So when they remember, so they were first using cells cultured in 2D, which again is not like real people. So they tended to fail a lot. And that's why now working with cells in 3D is really becoming so important for lots of areas of research. So good job. Good job, guys. So, okay. So we're going to move on. So this next slide just kind of shows you and it helps um, make my point. So if you look at the two pictures on the left, which it says 2D, and it says normal, and these are epithelial cells. So these are cells that you would find kind of like in your skin or making up the um, kind of the outside of different tissues or organs. Those are, these are cells that kind of hold things together. So if you look in the pictures on the left, the normal, there's normal epithelial cells and then cancerous ones. But you see in 2D, they look pretty similar, right? And they're pretty flat, they're kind of spread out. But then if you look at how they behave in 3D, um, the normal ones make these kind of nice tight little balls of cells. And then the cancerous ones are also three dimensions, but they've got kind of, they just look nastier, which is kind of what we think about if we think about cancer, unfortunately. Um, but they, they both look very different than what, you, um, than what we're seeing the cells look like. Um, when they're in 2D. So um, yeah, you're right, Cheyenne, they, they do look stringy. And I'll, I'll get to, and, and you see those kind of um, parts of the cells that, that are kind of sticking out, those little projections. Sometimes what cancer cells do is they, they kind of break out from where they originally are, and then unfortunately they can go to a different part of a person, and that's what's called when, when in a tumor or when a cancer metastasizes. And I don't want to get into all of that, but that's that's an, an unfortunate part of what, what happens with some with some cancers. So but yeah, they 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 just look kind of nasty. Um, but you can see that they look very different. And then if we go to the next slide, I'm not gonna go over all of this stuff, but this just shows you that not only do cells look different when they're in 2D and compared to 3D, but they also act different. Um, so again, you know, we talked about the morphology, but that just, that just means how the cells look. So again, they're very flat in 2D and much, look much more aggregated or like they're these groups of cells. They also can, um, proliferation means like how fast do they grow? So sometimes, um, cells in 3D can grow faster. Sometimes they grow slower, um, when they're in 3D compared to 2D. Um, and sometimes they can, like the nutrients, so that, you know, the food that you take in um, when you eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever, um, you know, that's the, the nutrient, right, that your cells eventually get. Um, so cells in 2D, when they're in all flat, you know, in the, remember that picture, they all, you know, those nutrients would have equal access to all of those cells because they're nice and spread out. But if you think of a cell, you know, cells in a ball, um, they're going to have those nutrients are going to have a much harder time getting into those three those three dimensional structures and getting to what's really inside. So again, so you can have that, um, and they also can be much more like that bottom one drug sensitivity. That's what I was that's what I was getting at before is that when they're in two D again if you if you add a drug to those cells again they can get at every one of those cells easily when they're in 2D cuz again they're nice and spread out but the cells many times are much more resistant to those drugs when they're in 3D again cuz they're all tight and they're in those groups um, so the drugs have a hard time getting to all of like maybe they're a, it's if it's like a group of cancer cells it has a hard time to get way down in there so it has a those treatments have a much harder time um, killing the cancer cells, unfortunately. That's, and again, that's, that's kind of some of the problems that they were seeing. So, um, okay. So, and then this next slide kind of shows you again, kind of a, a little representation um, to, um, 
of what's going on. So Shan, this this next slide that I'm show you showing you is kind of it'll hopefully this this is kind of the same thing that I was talking about with that other slide. So don't worry that you couldn't see all those all those words. Um, so so again, you know, we can think about how um, you know so so what it's showing here. If you look at that kind of brown ball of cells. So again, that says tumor. So that's that's another word for 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 cancer. Okay. So um, so again, um, uh, uh, cancer cells or you know any type of in 3D, um, they interact with each other. So you know they kind of talk to each other. So if you think about like if you know you guys are you know you know maybe between classes, you know when you're in school, when you're in the halls, there's lots of kids in the hallways. Everybody's talking to each other. Hey, how is your class? What are you doing later on? So cells when they're in groups. In, in like a three dimensions, they're all talking to each other. They can communicate with each other. Um, so they that so so that's something that's different. Um, you also have different um, signaling. So again, you know, uh, you know, not only are they kind of talking to each other, but they have these signaling pathways um, between in the between the cells they also have different um you know mechanical stimulus you know how they're being stressed you know when your bodies are moving around um you know that kind of that kind of thing and um so like i said they have interactions so they again they're talking to each other and different molecules are being passed back and forth um, between all of those cells and they also have a lot of times tumors um, will have blood vessels that are going into the tumors. So again, you know, again, all of this is is completely different than um, you know if. So a lot of this stuff doesn't exist at all when cells are in two dimensions. You know, all of that, the talking to each other, the the mechanical stresses, the interactions. Literally, a lot of that just kind of goes away or almost you know completely stops. Um, Another thing that's really interesting is that, especially for cancer cells, um, the one on the on the left, that green area, talks about immune interactions. So, part, you know, some of your blood cells are what what we call immune cells, and maybe you've already learned about that a lot in your in your science classes. So, immune cells are more of like uh, white blood cells, and they attack things that they see as something that shouldn't be in your body. You know, they see like a cancer tumor. Or again, um, a lot of immune cells in, in part of your immune system. Again, if we think about the, the coronavirus, you know, the pandemic that's going on, um, a lot, of, you know, a lot of parts of your immune system will see that virus, and they'll see parts of that virus as being what well, kind of like a foreign object, or it's like something that shouldn't be there. So they seek out that the virus and they go and yeah, you're right, Cheyenne, they, they go to kill it. And there are certain um, immune cells that that's their, some of them are literally called natural killer cells. So they seek out those like a cancer tumor or the virus and they're like, okay, this shouldn't be there and we're gonna do everything we can to um, kill them. Unfortunately though, a lot of cancer um, tumors, the immune system just isn't enough. And they know those, those tumors are pretty smart and they know how to avoid the, your immune system. So they kind of develop these tricks to, to, so that you know, the immune system can't completely kill them. So, um, so unfortunately tumors are, are smart, but we, so that's why we have to be smarter and do everything that we can to develop treatment um, to, to try to kill them as best as we can. Okay, so that takes us to our third question, which is, again, if you think about this, the, cell, the, the slide that I just talked about and what we literally just finished talking about is what types of cells work to attack a tumor, like those cancer cells, um, or, and what they all, you know, um, also the same, what types of cells work to attack a virus, like the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Is it heart cells? or blood cells, or immune cells, or stomach cells? Which ones do you think? And I just launched the poll. So again, if you see the poll, take it. If for some reason you don't, look at the answers on the slide and just put either A, B, C, or D in the chat. And we'll see what you all think. <laughs> so far, it's total consensus, but let's get a few more. And even I see Simon sure. in the chat also. 
I think we're going with total consensus on immune cells. <laughs> I think we're going with immune cells. Well, great job, everyone. So you were you were all listening very well. Excellent job. So you are exactly right. It's a your immune cells. So very good, very good. So all right. So moving on. Okay. So so now that we've we've been talking about cells and cells in three D. Um, so now, you know, we've kind of, we're all in consensus that, okay, 3D is great, you know, we should be working with it. But now we have to figure out, so great, we've, we've got these cells in 3D in a lab that a researcher is working with. So how do we, um, how do we see them? Or how do we know what's happening um, when we're working with cells um, in a lab? And I'm, what I'm showing you here, these six pictures, these are actually um, pictures, or what we call when, when you know, we, we also call them images. So um, these are actually images that I took, that I've taken um, during my time at biotech over the last, oh gosh, 11 years now. Um, so these are different, um, like the one on the top left, these are um, stem cells. I'm sure everybody is, um, you know, has heard of stem cells and the, the one on the top right, that kind of black and white, white one, that one that looks again, kind of like those cancer cells. So this is, this is a three dimensional um, uh, brain cancer um, spheroid. Um, Brad, the one in the bottom, um, I'm gonna jump in. Ken's asking, yeah. how do you take these pictures? Which I think- Well, we're gonna get to that, Ken. You are, so. okay, Ken's <laughs> You're doing a great job of leading into my next slides. So, so I will get to that in just a second. So, um, so I'll just point out one more of these, which is kind of cool. This, this picture on the bottom left is, um, so this is actually neurons. So these are three dimensional neurons like you would find in your brain, right? Um, or in your central nervous system. So, um, so, yep, so we can take these pictures, but again, how do we do it? So the answer is we use a microscope. Um, so, uh, so guess one, so one question I have is in your science classes, have you guys used, um, microscopes, maybe like the ones, so the ones I'm showing here are typically ones that you might see in a classroom. Um, okay. So Egan has Braden, Anna. Oh, great. Great. Looks like, like a lot of you have. So that's, that's great. So that's perfect. Wow. Wow. We've got a hundred percent here. Perfect. Awesome. So yeah, so and um, so you know these types of microscopes. Um, so you know you've got the the parts. Um, you've got these things called objectives, right? And they magnify. Um, so I'll get to that, Cheyenne. So just a second, <laughs> I see your question. Um, so um, uh, so you you know you can magnify or you can make the you know what you're looking at look bigger. Um, but these microscopes don't take any pictures, right? They just kind of let you look at what's going on and, you know, and you can be like, oh, that's great. Uh, but, you know, if I would want to really take a picture, you know, I can't really, I can't really do that. So my company that I work at, we have, um, we also have microscopes, but our microscopes look way different than that. So these, like this, this, these ones, these white instruments on the top, one says, Citation five, one says these other two say Lionheart. So these are actual microscopes. Um, of course, they look way different, but um, what's cool is that these are really automated. So you get to use software and you program what you want it, what you want, what you want it to do. Like I want it to take um, pictures of this and I wanna um, use object, you know, this objective. So I want it to look 20 times bigger, or I want it to look 60 times bigger. Um, and I can take pictures you know, with lots of different colors and, um, you know, and do lots of really cool things. The picture on the bottom that you're seeing, we even have um, ways that um, we, can, we can work with, with um, these three-dimensional things in, in with like lots of them at a time. And we can use a robot that, that um, what you're seeing in the middle and there's like an like an arm it says biospot 8 this is actually a robot and it moves um where the cells are back and forth to so what you're seeing the instrument on the right is that same citation 5 but of course we just turned it 90 degrees so this robotic arm moves 
everything back and forth and I can program it to basically start maybe today, this afternoon, and I can say, okay, I want you to take pictures every four hours over the next 10 days. And I can program all of that in and I press the start button and then I can go home and I could go on vacation for a week and it'll just do all that stuff for me. And um, then I come back and I've got all my pictures and I can get all kinds of, um, of you know, data and things like that. How big are those? Um, Braden wants to know. So they're maybe about two feet wide by about two, it's yeah, probably about two feet wide, maybe about two feet deep and maybe about a foot and a half to two feet high. So not very big. Um, the, the one on the bottom that you're seeing, the three instruments all together are, maybe that's about five, six feet long, all, you know, when all three are next to each other. Um, so that's how, uh, so that's how that, um, that's how that works. So then if we go to the next one, so again, like I said, our microscopes let you take pictures with lots of, you know, like yours, but we use this picture on the left, you see it says Olympus on the top. This is what we call an objective, and this is how we magnify, this is how we make the cells, because of course cells are really, 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 really little. Um, they're called, you know, what we call, say, microscopic. So we need to make them bigger so we can really see what's going on. So we've got on the right, you can see we can make things look like 10 times bigger, or 20 times, or 40 times, or 60 times bigger. And we can really start to see inside um, an actual cell, or actually we can take a picture of a whole organism, this, this black and white picture that says 1.25x, that's what we call a zebrafish. So a zebrafish is a fish, and this is the embryo of the zebrafish. So we can actually take a whole picture of that and see how, you know, what's going on there too. So we can do lots of really cool things with these um, microscopes. And then um, to take pictures in color, um, we um, can take all these different colors. So we can work with stuff that may look blue or green or yellow or orange or red. Um, and it lets us get all kinds of information. Maybe we can look at, um, uh, you know, maybe we can look to see are the, are the cells, you know, living and are they growing or are we killing the cells? or you know, we can look inside the cell at um, a nucleus or you know, lots of different things and we can use different colors to see um, what's going on. So, um, so that's kind of you know, how we can use these microscopes to really, really start to look at all of these different um, cells that we, um, that we work with. So, um, so again, I'm, so these next ones, I'm gonna show you some um, um, some movies. So not only can we take pictures just one at a time, let me, I'm just going to stop this. Some of my movies are, are, have a mind of their own here. So, um, let me see if I can stop that. Okay. So, um, what we can do is we can also take pictures over time and then we can actually make these, all these pictures or these images into movies. So like the one on the bottom left here that looks like the little green ball, this is again a tumor cell and unfortunately it's getting bigger. So you're gonna see over time and you see at the top it says zero, zero, zero. So those are how many hours. So when I start the movie, you can see that, that, that tumor, that 3D um, you know, representation of a tumor is getting bigger over time. Um, this one in the top left, these yellow, I'm gonna take this back to, um, to time zero. So what we can do, so again, remember I said that cells talk to each other. So I can, um, so one thing we can do is we can use colors to, to see the, all the signaling and how the cells are talking to each other. So you see they get kind of brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. So that's the cells talking to each other um, and communicating. Um, this middle one, we can also look at, so these are immune cells. All these little black little dots are immune cells. So we can, um, we can activate these immune cells. Um, and, and again, a lot of people now are using, are using your immune cells to attack cancer cells. So first we need to, um, we need to kind of get them ready to be put back. So this is done all outside the body. So we activate them and we get them ready to attack the cancer 
So this is what you're seeing. So these are cells growing and then they start to get really clumpy and these big kind of blobs. And then what we do with those immune cells is you put them back into a person and then they, they seek out the cancer cells and they go attack it. And then this bottom image on the right, that's actually what's happening. So all those little teeny little spots are the immune cell and the big kind of, you know, blob in the middle is the 3D cancer cell. So you, what you're seeing is that the, the, the immune cells kind of gather around the tumor cell and all of a sudden they attack it and literally the, the, the cancer tumor literally just explodes. So that's what we want to see. We want to see that it's breaking apart the cancer cell and hopefully then goes away. So those are some, these are some kind of um, different things that we can do with our, um, with, with our microscopes to, to do lots of different types of experiments. So, um, okay, so we talked about how we, um, how we take pictures of cells in 3D, but how do we get those cells into 3D? So, um, um, uh, oh, Emily wants to know how many more slides do we have? Not too many. Um, and I think we'll try to be done in like a half an hour. So, um, so what we do to get um, the cells in 3D is we put all the individual, so if you look at the little picture that says one, and we, so then what we do is we use these, what are called plates. And if you look at the two pictures on the left, um, they have these plates have all of these, what we call wells. And you look like, you know, you see it's, it's like a little, kind of comes down and it looks like a well, you know, like where you get water from, right? Um, uh, so, you know, we put, you know, there's that kind of orangey color, that's the media, remember, that's the nutrients. And so there's lots of these little wells and we can make, we can make a three dimensional group of cells in each one of these wells. So we put the cells in and then since the bottom is round, and that's what you can see in that picture on the bottom left. The cells fall to the bottom. And that's what you see in number two. And then they, they do what we call aggregates, or they all start to come together. And they make a three-dimensional structure that really looks like one giant big cell now. So that's how we, it's how we do it. So you, you, you can use these round bottom plates. And again, because it's round, the cells fall down. They fall to the middle and then they come together and they make this three-dimensional structure. So, um, um, so that's, how we, that's, how we work with, um, that's how we work with that one. So one question that I have is, do you guys think that um, if we wanna get our cells together into a three-dimensional structure, do you think using a, um, a plate that has, like I said, these round bottoms would work better? Or do you think using a plate that would have a flat bottom? So it would be straight across and flat. Do you think a round bottom would work better or a flat? Uh, so there, there is no, this is one you just answer in the chat. So Jack says round, Anna's round, Cheyenne is round. Desmond says flat. <laughs> Jack says mostly because the image shows it. Well, yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so the answer is you're right that the the um, <laughs> uh, it would be round because remember because it's round the cell it helps the cells fall to the middle right and then they when they're close to each other it helps them all come together and make this three dimensional structure if it was flat they all just kind of can spread her out around the bottom and then it's hard for them to come together but sometimes it works. Um, but sometimes um, uh, it, it definitely will. Um, um, they uh, again, you know, it, it will work if it's flat. But the the round definitely helps them to make a better, um, uh, more three dimensional structure where they're all coming together as one. Okay, so um, so like I said, we we use. Um, a microscope to take pictures of cells, but we there's kind of a special way because they're in 3D that we have to do it. So let me explain what's going on in this slide. So if you look at the little picture on the top left, so this is kind of a representation that kind of red ball. So think of that as your three-dimensional cells, right? So again, they, they, um, the, the, the ball 
you know, if you think of, you know, just a ball, like a baseball or a, you know, a, a you know, a soccer ball or a, a, you know, a ball you play with on the playground, um, you know, it has a length, it has a width, but it also has a depth, right? A meatball, there you go. That's a good one, Jack. So, um, so when we take a picture, um, and just like if you think about, if you take a picture with a camera, sometimes part of that picture is in focus and sometimes part of it is out of focus. So that's the same thing that happens when we use a microscope, is that you see part of your three-dimensional structure in focus, and then part of it is out of focus. So to see all the parts of that three-dimensional structure in focus, we have to take lots of pictures at, what we, at different heights, or what we call in, in when we're using a microscope, different Z heights. So you have the X, you have these different axes. You have an X, which is how long. You have a Y axis, which is how, how, um, how uh, deep it is from front to back. And then you have a Z axis, which would be kind of in, you know, how tall it is. So, so we need to take lots of pictures. And then if you look at the picture on the top right, this is kind of more of a real life situation. So, so th these are actual pictures that I took. So again, you see, we took one, two, three, four, five pictures or what we call slices. Um, and then what we do is, so, well, let me stop there. So then I'm gonna show you another movie on the bottom left. And this shows you all the different pictures that I took through this three-dimensional structure that had all these colors. So I'm gonna just start this, um, this little movie clip. And you can see how at the different pictures, different parts of that three-dimensional structure are in focus, and then some have, um, some are out of focus. So no, there's no, there's no volume. So you don't, you don't have to worry if you're not seeing, if you're not hearing anything. Um, so again, I'll show it one more time. So you can see how different parts come in and out of focus. And that's what happens, right, when you, when you um, take a picture of something in three dimensions. So then what we need to do is we need to take, you know, all, all of these pictures and we want one final picture where everything is in focus, right? Because then that's how we're going to really see what's, um, what's going on. So our microscopes and our software um, has different capabilities or, you know, um, uh, our, uh, we have what's called a, a, an algorithm. So basically it's just, you know, some, some um, software. And what it does is it takes the most in focus portions of each of all of these pictures that we took. And then it gives us one last picture where everything is in focus. So that picture that you see at the bottom right, that's what it gives you um, what our software gives you when you're all done. So it takes, again, all of those pictures that where some are in focus, some are out of focus, and it gives you one nice last picture where everything is in focus. And now we're like, oh, okay, you know, now we can see everything, and now we can, you know, you know um, look at what happened, what's happening um, with, with our experiment. So that's how we take pictures of cells in 3D. Okay, so now the last part that I'm, what I'm gonna do for maybe about 10, you know, maybe about five, six minutes is I'm just gonna give you some quick examples of, um, of what I, you know, some projects that I worked on just so you can see kind of some real life examples. So, so spheroid growth, so spheroid, that's another name for cells in 3D, okay? So what we did here was I had, so all these black little things you see um, these are, this was one of those plates. Remember I showed you that clear, that clear plate a couple slides ago. So these are all the wells. So these are pictures that I took of all my three-dimensional um, cells in each of those wells so that the, the picture is actually taken from the bottom. So you're seeing the bottom of those cells. And um, so at, when, you know, in the beginning, all of my three-dimensional cell, you know, structures look just, you know, pretty much about the same, which is what we would, what we would expect. Um, and then what I did, and so I should, I should say that all of these, again, are, are cancer cells. Um, so they will, um, they're gonna, you know, they will go, they're, they're gonna grow um, over time. And then what I did was I added to some of these um, wells, um, a treatment that should um, stop them from um, uh, from growing. 
you know, that's what, of course, that's what a researcher would look for, right? Because they want to stop these cancer cells from growing. So this, you can see there's different rows. There's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So the cells in, in row A got the highest concentration or the most of that treatment. And then going down, each row got a little less, a little less, a little less. Um, and then the ones on the bottom in H didn't get anything. So nothing's preventing them from, um, uh, um, from growing. So, okay, Cheyenne says, um, um, are, all cells, are, are all cells building blocks to the human body? Well, sure. I mean, because you think about it, all these different cells are, make up your body. So, um, all right. So, all right. So, so these are pictures, like I said, um, at the, um, at, at, when we first started and then in this next one um so then this is after 14 days okay so um so then um you can see that the the cells in row a remember because i said that i added a treatment that prevents them is going to stop them from growing so those look about the same right as what as at day zero um but those ones way on the bottom especially like in gnh where we really didn't you know add much at all to stop them from growing those got way bigger right those look a lot bigger um so i i've got another way that i can show you so here's another little movie so when i play this it's going to start or well actually let me this, this first one actually shows you again um how i'm able to take pictures at all those different um heights so you're going to see different parts of this come in and out of focus so i'm going to play that and you'll see that different parts, um, you know, now some are in focus, some are out of focus. And so that's what we do. That's, we take all, all of these different pictures like that. And then it allows us to see all the different cells when it comes in and out of focus. And then what we do is um we again remember we get them all in focus and then so this movie that i'm now going to show you on the left is at we're starting at time zero and then we're going to see how it's growing over those all of those days so you're going to see how it gets really quite a bit bigger um so again that's what unfortunately happens when you know with with cancer cells is they just keep growing and growing and growing and of course we want to stop that from um from happening and then what we can do um, is, is, again, in our software with our microscopes, we can determine how big or how much of an area is covered by this, three, this 3D structure, this 3D model. And you see that yellow kind of line going around the outside of it. So that, that is, um, that we, again, we use our software and use, we use um, different algorithms that puts that around that, and then we calculate or we determine um, the area that's inside of that. So again, we can do that again over time, and you see that yellow line, it follows that three-dimensional structure as it get big, gets bigger, and it follows that along. So then what we can do is we can start to make graphs. And um, so um, what this is showing you, let's just look at the graph on the left. So you see all these different lines and, and then on the right, you see um, like the, um, you know, the, uh, the top one says 10,000 and then it says 2,500 and 625 and going down and down and down. Remember I talked to you and I said that that's all the different concentrations of the treatment that I did. So, so the top one, 10,000, that got, the highest treatment. And if you look at that line, that's way on the bottom. So that's showing you that the area, and then we were able to calculate a volume, it's showing you that our cells aren't growing. So that treatment worked, right? So we were able to stop those cancer cells from growing. And then the ones that got hardly anything, you see there's ones, the line that says 2.44 or zero, those are the ones that keep going up and up and up and up and up over the 14 days. That's because we didn't do anything to stop those cells from growing. So, so we can take all those pictures and then we get numbers um, out of them. 
And then that lets us or lets a researcher to determine how they did. And, you know, did, you know, the, in their experiments, did their tests work? Um, did it work really well? Did it maybe not work at all? Um, you know, so it lets them know how they're doing um, in, in what they, you know, what they, um, what they want to do. So, okay. So, and then um, this last one, I just want to do real quick, because I want to see if you guys have questions. Um, we can also look, there's, we can make three-dimensional structures from stem cells. And again, I'm sure you guys have all talked about stem cells in your science classes. So, um, so in this case, we were um, making these, um, these groups of stem cells. And again, you, you put the cells in the wells and then they grow. So this time, we actually did use a flat plate and then the cells grow into these three-dimensional structures. And you see sometimes they get, they almost look, you know, they've got these little buds um, sticking out on the sides and then some are really round. And if we take a better picture, this is a better picture. So you can see this one right in the middle, it's got all these kind of um, buds coming off of it. And that's a really healthy cell. So these are cells that you would find um, in, um, in your small intestine, actually. So it's part of your digestive system. And you would want, this is very close to what you would see in your body. Um, but you can, again, do some treatments that would make your, your, um, those cells unhealthy, and then they lose that budding. And then they, like, they end up looking very round, like that one in the bottom left. So you can, you know, we can use that. And again, we can take these pictures, and then we can use our our software and we can put those those gold you know or those yellow masks and what we call it around them and then we can look at how the distance around or we can look at the area inside and that helps us determine um, the health of these um, of these three-dimensional structures because the the more buds they have the more healthy they are and then if they lose those buds it means that they're not quite as healthy anymore so so that's another way that we can work with, um, we can take all these pictures and then we can use our software and get numbers out of it and start to make decisions on, you know, our experiments and are they working and how are they working or do we need to make some changes and try something else. Um, so that's, again, just kind of a couple examples of how we can do it. And that's what I'm showing here. There's this spikiness. So you can see this one that's really round isn't very spiky, but that the other one next to it is um, has all those buds. So that has a higher spiky value. So those again are things that we can do um, with our software. So, so with that, I'm gonna stop and see if you guys have um, any um, last questions for me and you know anything else that you might wanna know about. Yep, so before we get to questions, and you can put your questions into the Q&A box, I'm gonna launch one last poll just to get some feedback uh, before we get into questions. So there's two questions here. We always just like to get some feedback on the overall cafe today and if you learned anything. So take a couple of seconds, do this poll, and then go put your questions into the Q&A if you have any. I know we have a couple in there waiting and we're gonna to get to those. Um, but just go ahead, please do the poll. If you don't see it, um, please let me know just in the chat out of one to five, five being the highest, if you learned anything today. That's the most important question. <laughs> we always wanna make sure you learn something. So I'm gonna give it about another five seconds. I'm hoping everybody would take it. I, no, we have a couple who haven't, but we're going to move on. So I'm going to close the poll and we're going to get into the questions that you've posted. And again, if you have a question, um, yeah, we're going to be getting to the questions in the Q&A right now. So put your questions in if you have one. So the first question is, how long would it take for the cancer cell to grow to be visible to the human eye without a microscope? Uh -huh. That's a really good question. Um, so it kind of depends because um, many cancers, you know, some are really grow really fast and they're, they're what we call aggressive and some are really slow. So 
To be able to see it with your eye, um, you probably would need to grow it for, you know, multiple weeks, um, you know, quite frankly. Sometimes you can see, you know, a really small speck um, with your eye after a few weeks, but, but it wouldn't be, it certainly wouldn't be after days. You would, you would definitely have to grow it for, you know, weeks or maybe even, um, maybe even a month at a time just to, you know, to, to make sure that you're, you're, you're actually seeing something. Cause, cause again, if you think about it, you know, cancer takes a while, um, to, you know, to, to develop in your body and things like that. So, um, um, so yeah, it's, it's going to take a little while for you to be able to see it. Uh, there's two questions that are very similar. What is the most important cell in the human body? And similarly, what is the most working cell in the human body? Oh gosh, body? wow, those are excellent questions. I mean, you know, every cell has its has a has a role, right? So they're they're all important in their own way. I mean, you know, probably some people would say a heart cell, because right, because if, if your heart stops beating. Um, you know, that's, that's a problem, right? Um, so, um, you know, other people might say, you know, brain cells, because, you know, that's, you know, you're, you need your brain to think and that's that, you know, you, you, that's where all your, you know, emotions come from and, you know, and things like that. So a lot of people would probably say your brain cells. Um, but if you think about it, every, you know, different organs um, of your body all work together to make you who you are and and keep you alive um so every every cell has a has, certainly has a role but again you know i guess if if, if you had to pick some you know I, i'd probably go heart or heart or brain um would be some uh, definitely some of um of the, the more important ones by certain and then what was the second question uh what's the most working a working cell right uh probably your um, your, your heart cells would be certainly some of the, you know, the hardest working, because again, think about it, your, your heart beats, you know, thousands of times a day. Um, then you multiply that times how many days in a week and weeks in a month and months in a year. So your, you know, your heart is beating, you know, millions and millions of times over your lifetime. So those cells are, are working pretty hard to keep that, um, you know, to keep that, uh, um, you know, to keep your heart beating. But again, you know, your brain cells are always, uh, always working, you know, even when you're, you know, you're sleeping, if you have a dream or things like that. So, uh, but I probably go, I'd probably go heart cells are, are some of the hardest work. So just coming in related, what's the least important cell? <laughs> oh my goodness. Ah, uh, Boy, I you know I'm I'm afraid I'm going to start insulting some cells here. So <laughs> I don't um, think they'll know that you're talking bad about them. <laughs> I know, I know. No, yeah. If I say like my little finger, then my little finger is going to start to hurt or something right. like that. So uh, that is a good question. Um, I that's a hard one to answer. I would I would hate to answer because again every. Every, you know, if you think about it, every cell in your body has a role, and and it's in, it's important in its in its own way. And even if it, it you know, you may not think it's real importance, you know, um, you know, if 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 those cells, you know, they're they're there for a re reason, right? I mean, people evolved into who they are and are using their cells um, for a reason. So you know, they're all important um, in their own way. So I'll, I'll be diplomatic and leave it at that. Uh, so two two of our participants both came in with the same question. How many cells are there in your body? Oh my God, I don't even know. That is an excellent question, and I would probably defer to Google. Right. That one. <laughs> millions upon millions upon probably, millions. Probably yes, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> so our our last question, although keep adding questions if you have them, but the last one we have for now is: How do you know what cell type you are observing? Um, well, you know, most, you know, um, in a, in a lab, I mean, people would, you know, um, uh, you know, years and years of research and, and researchers, um, you know, have worked very hard to classify cells and, and many, many times what will happen is that, um, uh, um, researchers will actually get cells that were, were donated by patients. Um, so they were, they're what we call primary cells because they come right from a person. Um, so, uh, so they might, and, and that's, I don't know, maybe some of you have heard the term um, called a biopsy. 
biopsy. So they take a small amount of cells right from a person. And then you would know that, okay, those came from, you know, your, again, your heart or your lungs or your pancreas or, you know, your skin or, or whatever it is. And you can also, you know, certain cells have certain, um, just, just like a person has certain color eyes or certain color hair and you have like a fingerprint, right? So cells, there's, you know, each one is unique in its own way and they have certain things inside them and on the outside of them that helps um, identify what they are. So, um, so that's really how researchers, oh, Emily looked it up, 37.2 trillion cells in a human body. Thank you, Emily. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so that's how you know what cells you're working with is they, because again, just like a person, they have their own ways to identify what they are. Um, so we have two final questions and I'm going to say these are our final questions because I do know Brad has to get to the airport. So we are going to end right on time today. Nope, so nope. Ken wanted to know how do you do a biopsy and Cheyenne wants to know what is the oldest cell in your body? Um, probably some of the oldest cells would be brain cells because they are not, you know, everybody has heard of, you know, that they, they typically aren't um, replaced. So some of the oldest ones would be in your brain and a biopsy. Now I'm not a doctor, so, um, but basically typically, you know, they, there's different instruments that they can do and they can use um that would uh you know that would be able to get to whatever part of your body that you need to get to to, to take the cells out and that's going to depend on if you're just taking some cells from your skin right just right on the surface of your body or they need to get inside and there's different probes and ways that they can they can put that in insert that into your body grab some cells and then they literally take it right back out again so it's not like you need to have surgery to have a, a biopsy but there's different instruments that you can use. So, but if, if you need to know more, talk to your talk to your doctor the next time you go for a checkup. <laughs> Guys, as always, fantastic questions. Great questions. Let's, Great thanks, questions. let's all thank Brad for his time and his knowledge today. What a great um, just a great hour plus of, of learning. So thank you so much. We truly appreciate you coming sure. and sharing sure. your thank work with us. Yeah, thank you guys too. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. So appreciate you having me. Great.